So tonight we have with us the Old Colony Planning Council, Lisa Sullivan and Lori Lindsay, both of you came, um, to talk about the draft housing production plan and issues of affordable housing and a possible decision by us to approve the housing production plan. Well, I need to say my chairman's statement oh, yeah. about the um, recording of the meeting. Go ahead. Please note that this meeting is being made available to the public through an audio recording which will be used to ensure an accurate record of proceedings produced in the minutes of the meeting. All comments made in open session will be recorded. Okay. Um, do we know if Jim's coming? Has he um, said anything? He didn't say anything. Okay. Well, we have a quorum, so we can consider it, but I was just, there were, I know that Jim and Dan were interested in some of the um, zoning issues, so I was going to wait a minute if they were going to be If they're not, then we'll just get moving right along. So, um, you guys had come in, what was that, two months ago? July 9th. July 9th. And now I guess it's up to us to sort of talk about, have there been any major updates to the plan? No, there's been, so what, I'll just give you like a history of where we, where we came from. So this was funded by um, the town of Pembroke applied for technical assistance and we worked with Ed Thorne to come up with a, what we thought would be most beneficial to the town. And we agreed that a housing production plan would be really a good thing for you to address. Um, OCPC tried to work with Pembroke in 2012 to do a housing production plan and kind of fell flat, just never got moved through all the no, you, wouldn't, you didn't finish what you needed to do, like approve it and accept it. So now they're only good for five years, so it would have been outdated anyway at this point. So a housing production plan, you want one because it's a proactive strategy to letting you know what to ter determine what kind of housing you want in Pembroke. Because once you get to the 10% of the affordable housing goal, then you can say no to a 40B or you can work with a developer and shape a 40B. Um, so the state would like everybody to be at 10 percent. And as of now, you have 614 units, you're at 9.52 percent. So you're really, really close. And then the 2020 census will come out, and we don't know what will happen, but we just know that you wanted to have a proactive strategy to keep up your housing units that are your regular housing units with your affordable units. So that's why we created the housing production plan, and it goals and strategies to kind of maintain 10%. So Lori and I drafted the housing production plan in the spring. We sent you a draft in June. It included some public outreach, which was a survey. We had 250 respondents. Um, we finalized, um, we came here on July 9th and we did a, a presentation to you and it included also a couple of pre brief presentations on things that we thought were more of the confusing types of topics like inclusionary zoning and the benefits of an affordable housing trust because those are some things people, towns, communities who are close to 10%, they navigate that way in most cases. Um, and then we waited a month we, for your feedback. We didn't get any real feedback. And so then we, we reached out to Matt in August and said, hey, could we maybe move toward approval or recommendation? Because the next steps with the housing production plan is we need the house, we need the planning board to endorse and recommend, and then we need the board of selectmen to endorse and recommend. And then we need your chief executive officer, Ed, to write a letter asking for approval from THCD and include the letters from the planning board, the letter from the selectmen, and the, the housing production plan itself. So that's why we're here. We're looking tonight to see if you would vote to endorse the plan. So the two things that we would be looking at beyond the approval of the housing production plan would be establishing some bylaws around inclusionary zoning, right, moving forward? That's a, it's a goal or a strategy. Right. You're not tied into doing that Good. recommendation. Okay, that's understood. And then the second piece was the housing trust piece. Yes. Could you explain that a little bit more? I was just recommending that you set up a, a, an affordable housing trust, which is, it makes it easier to um, purchase real estate and to move real estate okay. um, because real estate is so time sensitive and it allows a lot of times the affordable housing trust will 
they'll leverage like CPC funds. Okay. They'll have the funds that are set aside for housing, yep. and they might work with um, maybe like Habitat for Humanity or another nonprofit toward meeting your affordable housing goals. Maybe doing a project. Maybe you have town-owned land that would be well suited for either mixed-use development with an affordable element, and you might decide to you know donate. A, a tax title property and then let uh, like a Habitat for Humanity or like organization um, do a project on that that would and you get an affordable unit on your SHI that kind of thing. Okay. So that's that's really where so it just it's like streamlines <coughs> the process. And who establishes the trust? Is it done by the board of selectmen or is that a planning board activity? Um no it's we'd have to be the, the board of selectmen. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, got to be it's got to be funded, exactly. and then you've got to vote to put the properties money into it and money into it. And even if you use CPC funds to, to fund it, you have to. It has to be a mechanism to do that annually, just right. like CPC funds to you know they put ten percent mm -hmm. in housing, ten percent historical, ten percent in rec. If you want to fund it, it's it has to be a mechanism to do that every year. So it's not just like carte blanche where the money goes over. But there's a you have to register. You have to um, and I have to go back and look at it and this in a while. But I. Yeah, you have to, things get filed with the, um, the registry of deeds and um, there's, this, there's a trust that's set up and there's trustees and, you know, that's the whole thing is set up through town meeting and it's all reported. So. so again, that's a goal and a strategy, but you're not, by accepting the housing production plan, you're not roped into any of the goals and strategies, it's just a plan. Yeah, a blueprint. A blueprint yeah. for progress. <laughs> was really comprehensive, and the work you guys did was really great. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, with the background and the depth of the information we had on the demographics and the history and everything else, it was very helpful to have that in one document. And then it'll also fit into your master plan if yes. you go into that later. Right. As a matter of fact, that that's, could be the whole housing component of the exactly. master plan. It could be. Yeah. Can it? Yeah. I mean, is it? Yeah. Is that comprehensive? Yeah. But, really but comprehensive. I mean, just in terms of <coughs> the process for master plan. Some of you guys have been involved with before, but I had yeah. not done the master plan before. You might tweak it a little bit. It's a little big for inclusion in your master plan as it is, but you could streamline it. The data is all going to stay the same. So cut and paste what you really want. Yeah, in the data plan. alone is. So it would hold down our yeah. price of doing a master plan because the exactly. work is done. If well, you pull like that in in your open space yeah. plan that you have on the shelf, you have the two big components. Well, the right, goals yeah. are a big component, too. Exactly. And that's a huge part of the master plan. Because we've been trying to have, figure out how to approach doing a master plan given funding constraints. Well, you know, it. I mean, the housing component is a pretty big piece of it. Yeah. And our, you know, there's not a lot of, of um, interest in us going and asking for ninety or $100,000 to do a master plan. But if we could do one for less because we have components done, that would be a big Okay, so we'll ask for eighty-five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and some of the components don't change a lot, like soils and geography. Yeah. Right. Some of those we can just update from yeah. you just update, yeah. and a lot of your transportation things are already done through Old Colony Planning right. Council, so OCPC. And there's a, the ability to maybe ask for another DLTA grant next year, and maybe get a section, done. another section, yeah. and yeah. just kind of work toward that. And, and then, then like, just develop and then maybe it's like thirty thousand to have someone pull it all together. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a big piece of it. Yeah. It is. Um, has the Board of Selectmen reviewed the draft? They've have they had, given comment on the draft? They, they've had it since June. Ed said that it was well received, and we wanted it to go through the planning board for your comments. We didn't want them to have the first bite at the apple, because we, we're hoping that they will approve it. Yep. Okay. But we wanted you to be able to have so your... So your timeline is for, for you to get... Uh, you. You'd like approval tonight from I would us. like approval tonight from you. I'd like you to, um, through Ed Thorne, to um, provide a, le a letter saying that you what your vote was and that you approved it or didn't approve, basically recommend that for approval to them. Then they would go through a similar process. Um, hopefully they'll approve the plan. And you both write letters to DHCD, which would be attached to the plan and would be accompanied by a letter from Ed. And it would be sent to DHCD asking for approval. And then it would be good for five years. And it opens you up to getting more money, additional right. grants, extra points on um, 
other grants like Mass Works and different things like that. Now the other thing was, um, I know that the board segment after our last meeting with you guys was working on the number of, of affordable units we had in town and there were some additional units that they found. Did we still only stay at the 9.52? Brandon thinks that you're at 10, but until I see the updated SHI, which has to be updated, so he, what he did is he filled out some forms requesting new units, and he would have sent them in to DHCD for approval or verification, and DHCD will get back to him. I don't have access to that, and I can't see it in a system somewhere. So once they get an updated um, SHI, you're, you'll automatically, your units will be updated and your um, your percentage would be updated too. So how did, would that affect our housing production plan that we're talking about tonight? It won't affect it at all. In fact, this is basically, you'd be approving as it is, and then what you're trying to do is make progress to the 10. So basically we're saying you only had like 32 units to go. Um, there was, we, note, we noted that there was some in development. Mm -hmm. um, in some of the units that he were ta was talking about at the last meeting, some of the units are undisclosed locations, there are maybe group homes, right. um, and so they don't ever get disclosed. So we wait for DHCD, DHCD to tell us that they exist, basically. Okay. All right. So they update those automatically. But we wouldn't update the housing production plan no. to reflect the 10%. It would be, okay, now you've met that goal, moving on to the next goal of trying to maintain 10%, given that we're going to have other new development. And if we don't do something to maintain 10%, as we get new development, we're going to fall behind again. Yes, exactly, because your number of housing units is based on the 2010 census, and as we all know, your number of housing units is growing exponentially. Yes. We just don't know where it's going to come out in the 2020 mm -hmm. census. So your affordable, the amount that you're going to need for affordable units is also going to grow. So what we were suggesting with inclusionary zoning is to kind of put the responsibility back on the developers a little bit and let them help you with it with the problem because most towns are really not in the they don't have the resources available to be responsible for creating affordable housing you have limited resources and you can help and you can drive the process but you it would be helpful if if you with inclusionary zoning it kind of puts a little bit of the responsibility back on the developer it makes it part of it that if we're going to yeah. approve the plan that's fine, but we need you to help us see how this is how you're going to help us yep. to build our affordable units at the same time to keep up pace with the development that you're asking us to allow. Correct. Or also, if you if or if you want to allow regular developments with no affordable component, perhaps you, if you adopt an affordable housing trust, you might have an inclusionary um, a bonus that they would pay into the affordable housing trust in lieu of creating an affordable, affordable unit. So that's how that kind of works. It's like a little bit of give and take. No, we've been doing that with the sidewalk. We're just with the sidewalk. Yeah. 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 You don't have to build the sidewalks, but you, in certain cases, but you have to put into a fund. Or we can put the sidewalks maybe in part town where they'll be more yeah. um, uh, critical yeah. to allowing people to walk around town. Sure, connected to the streets or whatever. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have two sidewalks on a five-lot right. subdivision cul-de-sac. Maybe you put on one sidewalk, or right. maybe it's no no sidewalks if it's under four units. Yeah. So we've seen that in a lot of communities. So we already have that kind of the our developers are kind of used to that at this point. Mm -hmm. The ones who work in town a lot, who come fresh, we explain the theory and the process that. If you want to build it on both sides, it makes sense for you. That's fine. But if you don't, because it is such a small subdivision, we'll allow you to put that money somewhere else where we can do it. Because every time you add to development in town, you add to the amount of congestion in town. It yeah. makes sidewalks somewhere else more important. Yeah. And that's, a, in our mind, why it's not just holding up developers, but it's really you're adding to the development, and so you have to add to the development of the town. Um, as a consequence, so it's kind of a it's kind of a, a reason why we do it, not just because we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, somewhere in the in, in the plan, it you made mention of the deed restriction that was maybe I forget the actual wording, but it kind of. 
Yeah. Give me the impression that there might be a limitation on what the deed restriction can be. Usually they have perpetuity. So yeah. forever. Or, I think for, it said, or for a hundred years. <laughs> it all said of the what's ones allowed by law. And I'm just wondering what is the law. Well, the, I know we had like several cases where we had about 15 years or something and then the units were dropping off. Yeah, and they don't want that anymore. Th that's not like that anymore. I had a couple of those when I worked in the community of Bridgewater and they now it's into perpetuity. I think some of them originally were for 30 years and they would fall off. Yeah. Even some housing authorities, if you look at SHI, some of their, um, some of them, their affordability expires. And some people are using their, I know, they are using their affordable, their CPC funds to like repurchase affordability in certain in units, you've seen in some towns that they've done that with um, entire apartment buildings that used to be affordable. They were going to lose their affordability status, so they've they've used CPC funds to restore affordability or re retain affordability into perpetuity. Well, there's something called the rule against perpetuities, right? That says that that you're not supposed to have a, a restriction on land that lasts more than I know enough to read the rule when I need it, um, and it's like a 90-year restriction. Um, so when we say perpetuity, it may be like 90 years. There may be an outside limit on that, um, but I don't know if by statute um, the rules regarding affordable housing allow you to bypass that rule against perpetuities. The other, so it, there may be something, but it's like 90 years. Like there's a really long time horizon. But the other thing I've seen in deed restrictions is if it can't be resold, if there's no market for the affordable unit, okay. yep. that if, if you can't resell it at, that, at an affordable price, despite diligent efforts, then the deed restriction can come off if the housing authority or someone local doesn't want to buy it back at an affordable or, or market it on behalf of the, um, the seller. Is there, that's what, are you still seeing that? No, I'm a council's opinion on any of that before you go into those types of agreements mm -hmm. because the law changes so frequently with affordability and the state's objectives. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we definitely get council to look at any deeds that you write for these kind of units to make sure that they're. Would we actually be writing the deeds? It could be the housing trust or it could okay. be the affordable housing committee. It depends on how you set your organization. Okay. It's usually a regulatory agreement. That's what I've seen, and, and that's and what I have seen in the past is I saw we lost a unit in, in my past experience to foreclosure. Um, we lost a affordable unit, but it's my understanding that they that that doesn't happen anymore. The okay. writers are much tighter, okay. and that if you can't find an affordable um, a person who qualifies, you could. Uh, this is the way I've understood it to be: is that you're able to sell the unit. But the, the restriction still stays with it, so the people are limited. They can't make more than the 10 percent. So I, I've seen different deed writers and different plans, um, and so yeah, I'm just not sure exactly what would be in the deed writer. What would be required by DHCD as part of an affordable unit? So they approve all of them anyway. They all go to DHCD right. for approval, or if you have a, an agent or a, a lottery agent or something that would be working. With them. Typically, it's not done in homes. It's just right. too much. Yeah. So the question I had is: Have you seen any towns set up maybe a a rental unit, affordable rental unit use, so so that when the if it's if a, if a project goes in and its use is an affordable rental unit use? Do anything else in there to like subdivide it down the road or do anything like that would then be, be a change of use, which wouldn't be allowed. So it would all just stay as a rental. I have. They usually have a regulatory agreement with them. So anything I've ever seen, like if it's a for, from a hundred unit apartment to a three unit lip, like a limited you know proprietorship where you know we allow three units and one of them is going to be affordable or something. They always have. A perpetual or a very long-term deed rider, and they're going to remain rentals by the terms of the regulatory agreement. So it's it's really pretty hard fast. So without an agreement with DHCD, they could 
wouldn't be counted on the SHI. They wouldn't be counted on the well, SHI. Well, and, and without a, a change in the regulatory agreement, they wouldn't Correct. be able to sell it for anything other than a rental. You know, if they have one yes, of the three as a rental unit and that's under the regulatory agreement, they wouldn't be able to sell it to a new owner or change the use of it without some permission from some relief from that regulatory agreement. Exactly. Yeah. So they're either most of them they're either owner occupied or they're rental units. So you have single family, you have so they're supposed you're supposed to like in a condominium if it's an affordable unit and it change, changes hands, it's supposed to be go to an affordable, you know, someone who qualifies. It's not supposed to be like sublet or rented or any of those things. So there's a whole, um, you know, maintenance that goes in, is involved in making sure that um, there's a check and balance. That these properties change hands. This is what, that's why there's the deed rider, so that when they change hands or if they change hands, the community is contacted. So does that also work with single family homes or accessory equipment that's been deemed affordable? Uh, unless you have that particular deed rider with DHCB. You don't see a lot of the accessory apartments actually really being qualified as SHI because, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. So it's weird because we have it in our bylaws that you can do an accessory unit, but I think that what's happened is that the, to no, either no one's done them or they've fallen off the rolls. One no one monitors them. No one yeah, monitors monitoring. them. Right. So that it would have to be written into the deed. It would have to be a deed restriction. But in, in most cases, it's probably not there because the they've done it. Yeah. The relatives, in many cases, or they've done it, you know, way into having bought the house. So they're not changing that. Towns have such a the accessory dwelling unit is it varies so much from town to town. I have a see like in Bridgewater, where I live, you have to have an ac an entrance from your house. It, you know, so you it really is going to be someone who is close to you that you would put in that unit. It can only be 600 feet, square feet, and, you know, so it's, it's typically going to be a, a, a nanny flat or a granny flat or you're not. So we have we have two sections of our bylaw. One is a uh, an in-law or a family member accessory yeah. use and then this and that's restricted. This The permit is, is just for that owner. Mm -hmm. And then we have an accessory use for um, uh, for an affordable accessory apartment, which comes with very similar restrictions as the uh, family member. So I think... Is that where like, we saw the 15-year limitation? So I think that's what you're asking about. The, um, My sense is that the ZBA, you know, grants them... Is it a, yeah, it's a special program, I don't know what it is, you know, for the in-law, I feel like I see them grant those occasionally for the subsidized one or whatever it's called one. I feel like I can hardly remember ever seeing one of those. I, my knowledge was only one. Yeah. Hey, There's okay. only one? So to do that, you probably you need, a mo you need a monitoring <laughs> agent to kind of follow up with those and make sure the person still qualified. The majority of homeowners, it's kind of a complicated process, yeah, the yeah. fair marketing plan, yeah. and so usually, you know, the town might say when someone came before the ZBA for the special permit, for example, and wanted to set up one of these affordable units, you might re you would require that they have a monitoring agent right. and a fair marketing plan, and maybe, you know, the, I think that like the Plymouth, um, they have a, a down like a revitalization or housing. Yeah, something like that. They have an authority that does a lot of units that they market that. So it's part of a housing production plan. You don't see that as being a major component of. I mean, it's, it's a piece, but it's not. It's not what what maybe really one or two units. Right. It's it not really going to drive your affordability percentage. So that substantial. I have a question on that though. If a homeowner did go that route. Um, are they allowed to go out and find someone themselves that meets their requirements? They have to meet the requirements. They are allowed to do that. Though. I guess it would depend on how you set it up. There's so few of these accessory apartments after it was set up. Um, if you had it set up with a monitoring agent who has a lottery system, then you would go through the lottery and pick out whoever 
qualify during the lottery. No, but if like you were a Lucy Lucy, perhaps. my question is basically all of what you know, has one of the accessory units that's affordable. Um, do they get told by the housing authority who's going to live next door to them, or are they able to oversee that themselves? That would be on the site to set it up. Yeah. But but then the question is whether DHCD would approve it if it wasn't monitored by a monitoring agent. Okay. I'm not sure it would I get would approval as a plan yeah. if it wasn't monitored. There are a lot of hoops to go through. But you can go, you can use a local housing authority if they agree to do it right. to, as a monitoring as agent. Mon and yeah. what you could do, I guess, is you could interview candidates and say it's a, you probably could say it's a, you know, if there's an affordable component and then you could probably forward the information to the housing authority and say, could you vet this and see if this person qualifies. Maybe they could do it that way, you know, so maybe it could be a two-step process. I mean, because even in big housing um, developments, people have to meet certain criteria. You have to be able to pay the rent, what, even if it's affordable. Well, I mean, part of, part of the hard thing I, think, I feel like in the town of ours is that, you know, we're not necessarily like um, some really high-end town. I'm trying to not pick on anyone, but... <laughs> We're not um, we're not quite so high end that we don't have affordable housing as a matter of fact, even if it's not approved housing. We do have yeah. smaller houses in town mm -hmm. that are affordable, right. um, both from a purchase perspective and a rental perspective. We still have some stock in town, not a lot, but we still have some housing stock that is affordable in fact just because of market conditions. You know, we have some small cottages, we have some... Um, Low cottages. Yeah, we have, a, we have some smaller cottages that are still relatively affordable, that still would probably hit the criteria for affordability in terms of dollar value or sale price or in terms of um, rental price, but they're not approved as affordable units and they don't have deed restrictions as affordable yep. units. So they don't count as affordable units. But if you compared us to some other towns of a similar size that are wealthier, they might have fewer places in town where someone could afford to live mm -hmm. who was making median income versus Pembroke, where we still have an ability for people making a median income to find a place in town. And there's some towns where that's just not true at all. Like Bridgewater, I think, you can still find some places in town. We have we compete with student housing, yeah. right? Which and is we never, yeah. it's not affordable. Right. <laughs> well, but, right. It's but, it's <laughs> but it's some housing in town. You but it is, still got some it, housing it, that's... Okay. It is surprising to see some of the more affluent communities right there 10%. Yes. Because they have a plan. Yeah. Right. And they have right. an incentive to do it because right. of the, the cost of housing in those communities. So. You know, you'd be surprised at the the names of many of the towns who have hit the ten percent and gone above it. Right. I, I guess what I'm saying <coughs> is that we probably well, are, are above it in I, the yeah. sense of it's easier to find a place to live in Pembroke than in some of those towns that have hit right. their ten percent. But you have you have constraints here that have made it. You know, you do have the like we talked about the sewer, and you're still there. A lot of towns yeah. that don't have sewer, it's difficult to get to because of the density, but you have managed to do it. So, And one of the things we started to want to talk about is whether it makes sense to try to do some sort of cluster, um, you know, as part of an inclusionary zoning plan, do we try to come up with something like a cluster? Because in a, in a septic world, sometimes it's hard to find other ways to come up with affordable spaces. <laughs> A lot of it, you know, more property in town that's very easy to build septic systems on. And supposedly septic systems are getting soil. easier to build, right? What's that? Septic systems are supposed to be getting easier to build in the sense that there are some advanced... I was just having a conversation with a health agent, not ours, another health agent the other day about, you know, how they're able to put in some more advanced systems and avoid mounted systems and even on very small lots avoid tight tanks. And That's true. There's issues with a lot of that stuff though. It has to be monitored and you have to pay something to buy every six months or three months and look at it. But, 
questions? Any other can, questions? Yeah, I kind of want to follow on to my previous question. Let's say someone builds an in-law accessory or whatever that we've said is going to be affordable. Um, can they move their in-law in there if they meet the income requirements? They have a retired parent. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, you'd seem to have a regulatory agreement. If you're trying to get that SHI, SHI. That's fine. Yeah, we'll have the agreement. But they, they, they because could do typically that. you'd have to, I, I'm not going to say that you can or you can't because I'm not an authority on that. I wouldn't have the final approval. But I can tell you that in a LIP agreement, typically, like when you're doing in a lottery, if you were a developer and creating 12 units and four were affordable, you, your direct descendants or relatives would not be allowed to qualify for an affordable unit because usually that's written right there in the agreement. So an accessory apartment, there may be a different, where it's one unit, it may be a different, that would have to be approved by DHCD. Like and and yeah, most people aren't going to do that. They're just going to move their in-laws in and, and not move on. Open up their finances. Well, the, but the probably. incentive's not on the homeowner. Yeah. The incentive yeah. is for the town. Yeah. The yeah. homeowner probably doesn't have as much, well, doesn't have any skin in the game on that issue at all. So there's no incentive for the homeowner to want to add to the affordability. Well, I'm just digging around here to see what's palatable and what isn't. Actually, Jim, sorry to, I mean, I think to answer your question, it looks like on page 13 um, of the bylaws, um, it looks like it says, well, owners of existing permitted in-law apartments may apply for an accessory apartment special permit. So I think the answer might be yes. Um, well, but whether or not you could have your family member live there is less clear. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's. Um, that you need the same so permit to do it. under on page fourteen, it says that the you have to go to the housing authority or the monitoring agent to verify to verify the lease meets all of the requirements and that it's rented to a person meeting the guidelines. It doesn't specifically say it cannot be a family member, but it, it just says that you have to go through the guidelines. And these permits are not transferable with the property. So every time the property changes hand, the permit technically goes away, which probably makes the houses easier to sell, but it also makes it harder for us to hang on to the affordable stock. Well, it might make the house more valuable if it's got a permanent Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends whether or not you want to. You can decide to not rent it out, right? If you right. want to. Yeah. But I guess it also, I think one of the things that it opens you up to is like, you know, if I have an in-law in my house for my mother right now, and God forbid my mother moved on, what would I do with that apartment? Could I get a special permit or something to, to then make it an affordable unit? And according to our bylaws, you can. You could. Yeah. So I think it gives it a... a a, like a, another use beyond what the current what it's currently. If, if that, if the owner wanted to, do if the that. owner wanted to, yeah. one of the, I mean, one of the local builders was telling me that that in some cases they're actually building new houses with the sort of in-law apartments already in them, uh, just because I guess there's a lot of the demand for you know families with sort of um, you know their parents or aging or various situations. Or young people, people are staying. Them. That's mm -hmm. the other thing. Yeah. You know, the young people are coming back after college and staying. Mm -hmm. And mom and dad want their privacy. The kids want their privacy. And it's kind of transitional housing for that. So that's, that's another tool in the toolbox. And I guess well, we have to be able to sell this. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're not, you're not halls, committing, so. in all honesty, you're not committing to anything. You're With the housing production plan. Not the yeah, plan, but I mean, when we do some zoning changes, we have to be able to bring it to town meeting and so That's right. absolutely right. But you have a long, you can, you can research <coughs> zoning changes, you can look at other communities, you can talk to other planning boards and zoning officials and see what works. You're not committing, you're not accepting this plan and everything that's in it and saying we're going to adopt inclusionary zoning and right. we have an affordable housing trust. It's just we're going to look at it. You're going to look at it. It's a it's a conversation. It's already been a conversation yeah. started for you. You've all well, it also really opens us up to some funding sources that we may want to use to do some to work. look at it. Yeah, housing <coughs> choice funds, <Right>. housing <coughs> designation. So I think it's something that we want to You want to pass? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And then the conversation <coughs> continues on what it looks like in the way of inclusionary zoning. And hopefully we can reach out to you guys for some resources on that as we go. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I know that our grant has probably run out, but 
hopefully we can still call on you just as we'll call on the Planning Council resources, right? And we'll send you another application in December. <laughs> okay, get some more funding? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's do so, it. I'll make a motion that we approve the um, housing production plan prepared by and presented by the Old Colony Planning Council. Do we have a second? Um, all in favor? Aye. Um, anybody opposed? Abstaining? Okay, so we have um, four of us here tonight who voted in favor of it. So we would also ask Matthew to prepare a letter to our town administrator and let him know that we have voted in favor of that tonight. And that we'll be, you know, we'll be continuing the conversation on our front and um, about the zoning and about what that really might look like for us, which I think is maybe a tougher step for us. Thank you so much for your time, for reviewing our plan. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to working with you on future projects. All right, thank you guys. Thanks for coming in thank twice. You. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Yes, thank you. So yeah, the next thing on our agenda is talking about the visual screening options on, for the solar project. So, so the Groundhog Day. But where do we leave that? Wasn't it just that we were going to ask? Well, we said we are going to get some bids, or? We haven't gone beyond that at this point. That's the, that's the original one we put out uh, several months ago. Yeah. We left it where they were going to get the bid. Oh, Ed, Ed yeah. would have to get the bid, right? Weren't we going to ask Ed's help on getting bids for that? Yes. <coughs> bids on the fence. He would have to do it, yeah. Yes, and then, you know, and then the bids on the, um, the mulch. Weren't we going to ask for Ed's help on getting bids on the fencing and the mulch for the Habermuck screening? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we just need to give um, their office a, a sense of, you know, exactly what we want them to bid on in terms of, I don't know, design or, or, or structure specifications. I think, and, and I, then but all we really wanted was to extend the fence. But we've got $25,000. We have $25,000. We and, wanted to... And roughly speaking, I think I've got, what, 11000 in there? But was that for the fence? That's if you include 60 feet of fence and some mulch. Did you get a, a price from somebody on that? The fence? The uh, fence, yeah. I, I've got to verify it, but uh, that fence is at what you call it. The original fence. Uh, I'm oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I took my price of 4250 a foot. Because that's going to be prevailing wage, right? Doesn't that need to be? Well, it should be. Anything is done by the town. So uh, I talked to uh, Armstrong and Ken Van, and Jack's going to look at it. And I think we ought to go for 100 feet of tents instead of 60. Me too. Well, just up to that, did anybody put a tape measure on it? Up to that 60. tree? It was 60. It was 60. It was 60. It was 60, and you have to bend around. But I, I'd like to go for 100. Just to see where it comes from. Yeah. Uh, but also, I think we can probably go based on what is there, and the property go from more plants. If, but I don't think the plants are going to do any good. Where would we, I was thinking the plants further down on the road, you know, it's, it's for been, that gap that's right. Been been any, no one's going to water them, right? Yeah. It's, it's got seasonal foliage there that's going to be there and continue to fill in, and there's not much we're going to be able to do about winter time anyway. So, so we're, if we do a 100 foot <coughs> fence, to just extend the fence 100 feet and mulch mm, in front of, we clean it up and mulch the fences. That's really all we want to do. Right, you probably going to spend 15 grand. Good. So let's get the bits out. And then what do we do with the rest of the 10 grand? Do we have anything else well, we want to do to beautify that that area? We may need to replace the fence in a couple years. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we have to. Whatever we're we going to run out of time if we don't do this fairly soon. Yeah, yeah, I think. Like, yeah, let's, let's, spend let's leave an option there that we can always add more fence if we want. Because they can go up twenty percent over on quantity. Yeah. So, so can so we I ask Ed so Thorne yeah. to, to, to how we would bid a hundred foot fence? Clean up of all of the area along the sidewalk there and add mulch to make it look prettier so that we have a nice finish to the look. 
Okay. So even though you're looking at the solar field, you have a nice finish. Yeah, it's all neat and tidy. It's all neat and tidy. I'm just afraid of 100, so 100 foot stockade fence. No, but well, then cleaning up all along the sidewalk so that, you know, that area looks neat and tidy. Matt, what, so we, what, between we, the and the what we want is 100 feet of fence, but we also want to cost per, per foot after the 100 feet. Because we may decide if we get extra money or depending on how what the price comes in at. We may say, okay, do 110. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we might do 110, yeah. 120, because then we might loop it a little bit behind the brush, right? Right. right. To give a visual screening to the solar. And if you want, you could just do 100 feet with some motion. Is that what we said? Some motion with that beside what? That's the slope right across from the driveway. You can clean that out. Yeah, clean out the, the slope. slope. Yeah. We and want then to put down some motion area where you can clean down essentially. Yeah. So that things will grow, or, or just it'll look good. I, I can't remember if we, if if there was an area that didn't have room for mulch, but we just want to clean. It yeah. it just looks yeah. messy. A little fluffy, yeah. fluffy. It looks like it was left kind of yeah. unfinished. Yeah, I'll talk to Sabrina or Ed, and um, you know they, I guess, will try to prepare something in writing. I guess that describes it, or well, it's going to be some sort of a. Well, the key is we don't have a bidding process, really. I mean, we're not, we're yeah, not the procurement one. officer. Yeah. And so we just want him to act as procurement officer to give us 100 feet of fencing along that road to clean up the brush along the sidewalk yeah. and to add mulch along the sidewalk. Yeah. And someone could put their proposal, you know, that involves so many man hours of cleanup, <coughs> so much mulch, so that we can compare we, apples to apples. We really don't care. We just need to know what it is for 100 feet and then for right. each foot thereafter. And, and assume uh, a, a quantity of mulch and uh, a quantity of excavation and then get a unit price for it, then we can add some there. Yeah. Um, what do you, Dan, in terms of mulch and cultivation, yeah. how would you phrase that? Yeah, it's just text on uh, I, I can talk to a few people, you know, independent from me, local contractors, and just get some figures. Well, no, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of how we would word, word it. Well, we, we clean up standard growth. Clean up mulch. overgrowth and mulch. Clear and grow, remove grub. Clear, remove. clear and grub is the standard yeah. term for thank you. Yeah. Pre clean up. And grub, clean up? Clear and grub, yeah. Clear and grub. Yeah. Well, we clear and grub. Well, yeah. we're not going to clear. We're just going to. Well, you are between the, the back side and the fence. The sort of fence is actually going. Yeah. You don't want to clear. Well, they're just you the grass in high, tall yeah. 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 grass. You strip, you strip the room and then put it in. Of course, you might put it in top. <laughs> okay. So that's so we want to we want to have a hundred foot fence and then a pricing per foot thereafter. We want to clear and grub the overgrowth between the sidewalk and the fence and add mulch to that area. And we want to, I think not just between the sidewalk and the fence, but also to clear the overgrowth from the sidewalk um, from the next hundred foot of the sidewalk, let's say. Yeah. That the, the growth, the overgrowth would be cut back and there'd be mulch be between the sidewalk and the mound for the next hundred feet as well. The, the next hundred feet beyond the fence. Yes, the yes. So between the fence and the sidewalk, as well as past where the fence is, yeah. just clean it up. <coughs> don't add a fence. Don't add a lot of growth, but just clean it up. Just that slope of the back side of the sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just clean yeah. it up. Yeah. Clean and mulch. Clean yeah. and mulch. Clean, clean the mulch. overgrowth and mulch. Okay. So Matthew, we're going to. So our next thing is reviewing administrative matters. Our next board meeting is scheduled for September 10th. Um, <coughs> if you guys are going to have a hard time coming, just let us know so that we know if we need to move anything. We're going to have an executive session on September 10th that will be noticed um, regarding um, 24258 Oak Street. And I'm going to litigation there, um, so we're not going to talk about that tonight. Matthew is on vacation for the week of September 17th to 21st, so if you need him, try to get him before then. Um, so we're wondering whether or not we should, if we have a board meeting on September 10th, our next board meeting would then be September 7th, 24th. With Matthew out of town, it can be logistically difficult to get a meeting <coughs> that night. Well, Do we why, want to? why don't you pass him just another week? 
Well, well that's the question. Should we uh, have it on October 1st? October 8th is a holiday anyway, so we typically wouldn't meet the second Monday because it's a holiday. So maybe instead of having the 24th, we have it on the 1st, and then, and then because we're going to skip the 8th as well. So don't Sounds have the 24th and the 8th. Are we okay we'll have with that? three meetings in October? No. I guess depending on how busy. I mean, probably not unless October 1st is being incredibly busy. Probably the 1st and the 15th. Okay. I mean, we don't have a lot of stuff going on. Not right now. Okay. And that always could change, but at least for, yeah, the next, looks pretty slow in the, the next month. And so, I mean, we could, I mean, we certainly could do September 24th, but it is a bit awkward to try to do it, like, right after my vacation, just because then I have to sort of post the agenda, like, a weekend beforehand. Things may change while I'm not there. So, I think October 1st is going to be easier. Yeah, I think we'll yeah, go to the first. Do we need a motion for that, or are we... So we have the first and auxiliary meeting on the first. Is the is the first and the fifteenth or the first and the twenty um, second? You mean for October? Yeah. I mean, I guess twenty second is the day before town meeting. I think that's correct. Yeah, then town meeting is October twenty third. Thirty seven eighty eight for our defense. It's not really inexpensive. Does it's called? Forty two. All right, so we're going to say October 1st, and what's the other date we have in the calendar right now? Well, so the next one is September 10th, and then after October 1st, I don't think we need to decide right now. I mean, we could, I suppose, tentatively say October 22nd, but I I would suggest, you know, not decide. That's before top meeting, though, so don't we usually, yeah. like, not do the Monday before, so maybe the 1st and the 15th? So the 1st and the 15th, I think, is what I would tentatively schedule okay. if people yeah. are looking to put things on our agenda. That sounds good. The 1st and the 15th. Okay, so the first and the fifteenth. We have minutes in the in our file for July thirtieth and August thirteenth. Yes, installed. Okay. So do we have to approve the minutes for July 30th? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, and then August 13th, I wasn't here, um, but we've been told that we can vote on them even if we weren't present. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that we need to delay this. It doesn't look like a particularly difficult um, set of minutes. So I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes for Monday, August 13th, as submitted. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I don't know I'm staying because I You're haven't gonna really caught up on that. I think we're okay because we have three voting, yes. So we're good. Okay. Um, Dan and Dan signed the final drawings for the Wolf's Den. Are we done with that? Um, we have another extension request. Um, the developer of Dominic's Way subdivision at 56 Gorham Ave in Pembroke has submitted a letter requesting an extension from September 4th to October 4th for the application review for the subdivision. Um, we finally got revised drawings to Peter, who's going to do his reviews, review soon, so we should be able to vote on and sign the final conditions of approval on September 10th. Um, so for now, it, the only... Um, question is for us to grant the 30-day extension. Do I have a motion for someone to grant a 30-day extension for the subdivision application review for definitive subdivision number 1801 entitled Dominic's Way and located at 56 Gorham Ave from September 4th so to moved. October 4th? <laughs> Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, the clerk needs to sign building permits for Bryson Way Extension Subdivision. We've already released the lot, <coughs> so we'll let um, Tom sign those. So apparently... I guess we just need to vote to have Tom sign them. So I'll we'll make a motion that we have the clerk sign the building permits for Bryson Way. Do we have a second? A second? Second. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, planning board members are being reappointed as special municipal employees. And that allows you to still take part in dealings with the town on non-planning board matters because you're a special municipal employee as opposed to a general municipal employee. There are still ethics issues and conflicts issues that aren't waived by this, but it is a different category. It's a little bit less restrictive. In order to be deemed a special municipal employee, there is a advisor, there's a reappointment form in here. You need to fill it out and leave it with Matthew tonight or else you will not be uh, reappointed as a special municipal employee and you would be deemed to be a regular municipal employee for conflicts of interest purposes. So take a look at your packet and um, leave and it I, with Matthew. And I guess to the best of my knowledge, there's no disadvantage to being a special interest. Um, so. Um, we also had a question on um, ordering new assessor's maps for fiscal year 2019. We've always done it, um, not always, I, I don't know, but always, but we've done it in previous <coughs> years. There's a form in our folders about ordering the assessor's maps. Um, it's $75. We have money in our planning board office budget. Matthew finds it very helpful to have the assessor's maps, and so we're asking for the board to authorize us to order how many sets of maps? Do we just get one set, Matthew? Yeah, just one. Um, and yeah, they, uh, they're helpful to have. Um, so, you know, I Okay, so can I get a motion to um, order a set of the um, assessor's maps? at a cost of approximately $75 per map for using our planning board office budget? Now that's typically the assessor's maps come uh, 18 by 24? Yeah, they're those big. But, but is that, that's, those big ones there, I think they're 18 by 24, yeah. But there's what, it's like 70 pages? Uh, yeah, it's like a lot those. of pages. Yeah. Okay, so it's not per map. Per exactly, yeah, okay. for the whole, for the whole thing, yeah. She <laughs> says per map, and we mean per set. I'm yeah, sure she We always have them, yeah. and they're yeah. very handy. Yeah. Yeah. Was and it does say order. order one set of maps. Right. Okay. So am I off, so I'm looking for a motion to authorize yeah. me to sign this request. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I think it was unanimous. <laughs> okay. Um, So the Recreation Department's Manakisa Ball Fields project site plan expires October 14th. The site plan's <coughs> deadline for completion has been extended many times since it's a long-running project dependent on town funding. Do we need Susan Roche to come before the board to request an extension, or can she just submit a written request to extend it for a year? And my recollection of this project is that they'll take on pieces of the project to accomplish the site plan, but it's not something they can do in the usual two years we would put on a commercial applicant. So um, do we want her to come before the board and explain the status, or do um, we want her to file a written request? How do we get that request? Huh? How do we get the request from her? Just verbally or? So email? far? Yeah. I, think, I, mean, I, think, I think two years ago, she, she sent an she email for the board, and then I think last year just submitted like a written request, uh, which she signed. I mean, I don't think it can be verbal. I mean, it's bad. Did you talk to her this year, or did she yeah, send I just an email? Yeah, talked to her like a few weeks ago. I just she just happened to be here, so I mentioned it. Um, I mean, I think she's you know willing to come before the board if you want to. I don't know if it's really necessary. Is there anything to talk about though? Yeah. No, I was just yeah. saying if she sent an email, we could consider that the request and go ahead and grant it. Yeah. And go ahead and grant it. Um, yeah. No, she did. Uh, no, nothing <coughs> yet. Yeah. Well, I'll have her send, send a written yeah. request. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and an email would be good. Yeah. yeah. Does, does she have any plans that you know of, Matt, to do anything else down there? I believe she still wants the extension. So, yeah, I think she still has plans. And I think, I think from what she said, it is kind of gradually moving forward. And like Becky said, I guess it's just a question of taking it sort of chunks at a time and as through the town releases. 
So Matthew has a new nameplate. Matthew, can you show us oh, your yeah, nameplate? Yeah, yeah, sure. After two oh, years, I finally got it. Yeah, I ordered it for five. It took two years. Okay, good. Well, I mean, it only took, once, I ordered, once I finally ordered it, it took about a week, but it took two years to order one. So, so we need to order a nameplates for our two new members. Uh, Matthew had asked if we want to order them for all seven members. I don't see any reason that we have to all no, match. No, no, we can, we can make them like days. Yeah, I think I think it's just normal. Yeah, I think two cheap, is probably as, fine. As cheap as we can. Yeah. Just order. I mean, unless you want them all. Unless you want them all. <laughs> just as an FYI, we've talked at different points about the fact that there was going to be a billboard um, along Route Three, and the ZBA did grant the request for variance for that uh, billboard, and it's then it, it, only one can be granted by MassDOT within a certain space of each other and Marshfield was also working on granting it that was actually going to be on our side of the highway but Marshfield land that's on the Pembroke yeah. side of the highway <laughs> and so we'll um, get the money. Oh, that <coughs> but we wouldn't have gotten the money so we'll see whose board gets approved by the state or by the develop by the um, we still have to wait for that we still have to wait for that and I just got an email actually from the finance of Marshfield today it was today asking if it had if it was true that we had approved it or, or that Pembroke had approved it. So kind of Everyone's kind of pushing to be the first because only one town is going to get money out of this. Hmm. And either way, there's going to be a billboard in that area. Just tell them what's going on. You're right. <laughs> um, we were asked to, to submit to KP Law an administrative record of proceedings for the Oak Street site. Um, as part of that ongoing litigation with Matt, which meant you did. Um, so, on the updated map of the town owned land and open space that we've discussed, Matthew is going to try to create this map instead of having Peter do it. He's trying to learn how to use the software to do it in Alps. Yeah, actually, so for that, actually, I just talked to the guy today at PeopleJS, and it's a little different, it turns out. Um, so, we can't do it? It looked, well, I could if I took this training, which was like $1,500. Um, but it, it sounds like they could, the guy there can do it for about maybe 200 bucks, like 100 or 200 or 300 somewhere in that range. Sounds good to uh, it wouldn't, but it wouldn't be the map, but it would be, it would, I mean, it's kind of hard to, I don't know if to do it. But basically, they could add a layer to the to the GIS that you can view on the web, which in some ways would, be, would actually be better than the map. Uh, yeah. But then you can zoom in and stuff. That's kind of what I was suggesting. Yeah, yeah I mean, we've been talking really, about trying to do GAL. It really would be more, and then potentially we could make a map based off that, you know, in the future. So that's, okay. that's going to cost about 300 bucks. I think at most, yeah, I mean, that was my sense from Tom. And so I'm talking to Kathy, and we'll talk with Bob Clark to get a sense of what sort of yeah. he yeah. wants to show. You get a, get a high number of <coughs> So the only other issue for us tonight is this issue of how possible changes to the zoning bylaws and how we want to begin to talk about those and look at those. Matthew, I, we had an email from you about a list of items to look at there. Oh, list too, by the way. Oh, yeah. But I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, that was helpful. Right there. Yeah, this is sort of a lot of items. Well, I guess you are. You all saw the list. You know, we may the planning board may decide to only address you know one or two of them, or, or a lot of them, or other things. So this is just kind of a starting point. So, you know, so don't be this was or, this was good. Um, this was really helpful. Yeah. But thanks. It's it's sort of the result of I guess two years of being on this job and kind of seeing you know some things that are just sort of like things I don't think would be controversial. We could <coughs> sort of ask KP Law to. Uh, fix um, just sort of more housekeeping technical stuff and other ones in the group. I've also got even I want to see these but this thing from KP Law which was actually for the kind of in relation to the litigation where basically Carolyn Murray was kind of saying like you know we should you know that kind of there's a bit of a contradiction that we should just that would, it would be good to sort of go ahead and kind of rewrite just to clarify with regard to like whether an whether a site plan appeal goes to the ZBA or to the land court, whether it has to be within 20 days and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, some of this is just cleaning up 
some stuff and making clear some contradictions. Uh, well, there's some of them that are a little more aggressive, though. Yes, I think you can put them in a couple of categories. Right, right. right. Like, um, for example, the um, the the business B lot size. That's probably a little bit bigger issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the Front use variances, here. whether we would ban use variances, I think is a bigger issue. It's a huge issue. Uh, whether we want to go back and look again at uh, multifamily mixed use or assisted living um, yep. in the center of town or elsewhere, that's a big issue. Yep. So Accessory good. dwellings and whether we could design them in a way that would help increase our affordable inventory, as Jim was talking about tonight, that would be a big change. Yeah, but I'm not sure we'll be able to accomplish that with accessory dwelling units. That's, I mean, we could talk about it again, but it's very tough, I think it's very tough to do. The thing we don't have on here <coughs> specifically is um, other ways to achieve inclusionary zoning. Right, and that's going to be, I think, something we want to talk about. And that's where you're talking more about some, we we'll use the word cluster, but maybe some some zoning changes in town. And I think we want to look at uh, the special permits as a huge one. Uh, we would have fixed use, the uh, use variances. Would we do smaller lots in some areas of town? That's another question, if, yep. If the soils, you know, in one area of town or one area of town's higher, could we justify smaller lots that could still my th be my easy for septics? Yeah. My thought was to, uh, you know, just to give a nod to the you know, Board of Health regs and mm -hmm. the Wetlands Protection Act and all that stuff. And but what you could possibly do to leave it as flexible as possible is come up with a limitation of the number of bedrooms you can have per acre. Mm -hmm. So it could be one six bedroom house or six one bedroom houses or whatever works, but it would allow a developer some flexibility to work with that particular piece of property. Yeah, I think we want to do a lot of due diligence on that one. Yeah, so how are we going to move the ball <coughs> forward on that one? Well, did we talk about having a subcommittee get together and, and look at some, some of these things? We I, did. Well, I did. No, number one on their list in the production plan was that the new zoning for that would be put together based on a, a joint committee from planning. I think every every town department except animal control. <laughs> so I, I thought I thought that's probably so a good way to make sure nothing would ever happen. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, but you may, but, but, but with, that, with that issue though, you may want to have um, you know the health agent board of health involved with it. Right. Right. You may want conservation involved with it because I think Board of Health they don't have too many regulations that would be hard to deal with. Most of their regulations are based on where groundwater is, what the soil is. It's not a lot of like you have to be the law has to be this wide. We need this much frontage and this much area and stuff like that. But you that. know that's how we, how acre zoning or close to acre zoning is justified. Generally, it's based it's, on septic requirements, that you yeah. can't have greater density and not end up with septic problems. Because otherwise, our zoning would be exclusionary zoning that would be hard to uphold. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's called the nitrogen loading requirement, that's, but that's, um, that's when you have wells present. That's usually four bedrooms per acre. Four bedrooms per acre when there's a well present. Yeah, in a certain distance of a well. It gets more restrictive than it happens to be a town well. So there are a lot of issues involved in it. So are we just saying that that committee will be formed according to the housing production plan? So that issue we don't necessarily have to take on. Well, that committee will take it on. Well, I, I, I think we want to be very careful about that. We may want to take a leadership role in that area because we, we are the zoning. We, we, have, we, we are the yeah. ones that write the zoning. We write the zoning. Well, the zoning has to come before this board for a hearing before it goes to town meeting. Regardless right. of what committee develops True. the zoning, just by matter of law, it has to come back to us True. before it goes to town meeting. But I would hate for a committee to go through a ton of work on this and then it come to us and we raise all these questions at the end. Right. Correct. Because that's not fair to anybody True. who's doing the work. Right. I always hate that in any committee yeah. process. It's, it's why, you know, trying to get the right parties involved is so important up front because, again, the committee 
people want to work in exactly what you said. So. Well, I think people are involved. Yeah. You get you, you you gain you know you, you benefit from their knowledge and you benefit from. And My thought was that basically, if we do do something with zoning, we, I mean, you have to follow board of health anyway, and you have to follow what we call the Wetlands Protection Act anyway. Right. Is, is there like a state template to get us started with this, like a on ground zero or on on in general? In general. But the like, zoning bylaws state templates that you can like start. Well, so I have a Westlaw template, like um, a mass practice series yeah. type uh, template. But, but unless we want to go back to unless we want to go back to square one, yeah, which I don't it's think hard to, to start with those templates because sometimes it gives you a fresh look. Okay, like, hey, where do we go astray over the past twenty years? I mean, I guess Change we could look three. at it. I could send it around to the board to see. Look at it and see. Are there things in here that we haven't even thought of or considered? Well, maybe we well also, we don't. You know, we've got a list here. We can consider two or three of them. You know, I think at we, a time. Yes, yes, because that gets things done. Right. The, the worry about a template is you start to reorder the way it's done. Yeah. Right. Well, I understand. The language things. stuff and it gets it, you can get bogged down in yeah. a lot of legislative language. Yeah. But somebody that hasn't been in it, like but for myself, hasn't been in it as yeah. long. Like you've seen the transition. Now me bring it new. I just get what we have. It'll be interesting to see where did this derive from. You know? which, which of these issues would you guys consider to be most? Some of them, some of them look like they're just almost wordsmithing and stuff like that.
business in those lots, so there's going to have to be a discussion. Um, but on the business B... Well, you know, you may also, and to your client, though, some of those lots may be a lot smaller than 80,000 square foot, but in its residential commercial, we don't see a lot going in there. Right? And that could be a problem, a because we want it to be kept up. Right. <clears throat> so... Is it serving our interest to have that requirement? No, well, we should, I don't think so. Have you had to issue many variances? Well, we can't do the variance. Well, it's just business B2, by the way. I mean, it's not the other zone I was talking about, but uh, we might want to look at that also. But yeah, I think the CBA has issued a lot of, quite a few variances for that. Yeah. Uh, just because, like I believe for the Irving Harlow, I think there was a variance for that. I, mean, I just, always thought that one had 80,000 square feet. I think, I think it does, doesn't it? Well, it had well, something else. Was it a fan issue? It was they, they didn't a green need space, wasn't it? I know they needed variances, but I they didn't think it was a right so But definitely for some projects they had, just because for you know most of the parcels along you know 139 are you know their own parcels and they're just less than 8,000 square feet, and it's hard to sort of assemble the parcels together. So well, and I guess part of my question there though is, what are you going to end up with a lot of tiny little? Um, like people turning the residences that are on a 40,000 square foot lot into a business. And is that what we want or don't want? Is that going to create like a chop a block feel to that street as opposed to some kind of cohesive development where, I mean, I think one of the things we run into sometimes with the smaller developments is we want to, we want to make things work. But sometimes do we end up not getting things engineered as well because it's a small little project and, we, and we're trying to bend over backwards to make it affordable. Do we end up with less sustainable, less desirable business development in that district if we reduce the lot size? Because the projects are so small they can't afford the engineering. Do it. At least we're giving them the opportunity to, uh, to try without bearing it. I mean, we can't really reduce well, this. Not like when they go for the variance, they don't get it. If, so, if, if they wanted to build, they had 40,000 square foot lots, buy one next door, I ain't got 80,000. Well, I, I think that's what we thought in the past, which is. That's what happened with Irving Oil. Right. You put a couple lots together, you right. can do a project, and then you can do a project that's a nicer project. Right. There are a fair amount of small businesses along that corridor there. That, there are, right? that you could do in a house. That they, they are. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. they convert. I mean, you could do your, your you know, dog grooming. Well, part of what we've done is we've made it so it's hard to take a house and convert it without it being owner-occupied. Um, it's still taking place like crazy, though, so... Is it really... Well, they don't require site plan, because I don't be doing anything. I'm setting up shop, right? Well, and when they do a variance, that, I mean, the one thing that <coughs> is the downside of getting a variance, as opposed to having it come through the site plan process, is if it doesn't fit, then they go get a variance, but then they don't necessarily um, come back to us for a full site plan. For a full site plan. Unless they require it to, you know, put in a parking lot, raise the roof up and expand out the building, then, then that triggers site plan they come to us. But if they just have a use, they'll just get buried. And they can set up inside. Plus it's hard for like the dog grooming person to, to, to buy the house next door and have 80,000 square feet. Right. It's expensive. Yeah. yeah. We keep small businesses out of town that way. Yeah. We're, we're going to end up more big box than small businesses. Right. Yeah. We more survives the sneaky end of the radar ones, you know? I really so think a business on the one acre lot is not going to be that obnoxious. And I do right. see your point about having curb cuts all the way along. But I think that's going to be regulated by my side. Unless you've got it for driveways now. If you already have there. a driveway curb cut, do you need a new curb cut? No, right? Um, possibly. Well, if it's a business house, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
need to go before Mass Ave. Right, right. So if Mass Ave is <coughs> a 12-foot driveway and you want to put a 24-foot entrance in, you've got to go to Mass Highway. But are you going to do that at a 40,000 square foot? No, no. What probably I'm saying not. is that probably not. No. So. <coughs> well, but I if mean, you're going to get enough parking in there to make it really viable, I mean, part of the problem is that if you can't get a site plan, you can't get it um, sort of looked at as a, as a business, people are going to have people parking in what is supposed to be right. like four or six residential parking spaces as opposed to like laying out a little parking lot right. in the backyard. Or yeah, but they may only require four or five spaces for the type of business they have. They may have a, right. you know, a scheduled business like a physical therapy business. At least it'll yeah. be properly drained, you know, <coughs> everything kind of matching the tunnel if they got to go through the planning process. Well, that's you. That's yeah, it's a big issue. We don't want to deter them. From that. So I think it bears looking at. There may be a there may be a nice uh, middle ground on that. So this one looks. This one we take a little more discussion. Scenic, and we may and we may just leave it the way it is too. <laughs> and then scenic roads. That well, one I think is pretty easy to just mention it, exactly. so people well, see it. We yeah. have it, but it's in the town bylaws. Is that correct? Is that I thought. I don't know. Maybe it's in the town of Ireland. We've never been able to find that, I think. Yeah, I mean, you have to go back to the to the old annual town meeting report to actually find the documentation. Ah. That's what I did. And so, I mean, I've got I've got a list of, I mean, I've got a list here. So we should add it. Um, but, you know, for the average developer who maybe is looking at our, our zoning bylaws and our rules and regs, um, so it should be added to the yeah, so zoning bylaw. Yeah, I, I see that as on the administrative line of, yeah, we should clean it up. Yeah, if possible. The yeah. difference between the zoning map and the bylaws text, that sounds like a bigger project. Project, I have to say that the assessor's engineer mapper, there are things on the assessor's map that don't match land court maps. Um, Your house. My house. <laughs> <laughs> Exhibit A. That, that's the most important property. No, but my point is, if it's if it's true there, I, oh, yeah, I, I no, I've been at other houses where I'll um, be showing a house and I'll try to look at the map, and the assessor's map does not match reality. And then if we go through it, I'll see that there were other um, changes done along the way, and so. A lot of people feel that way depending on the tax. This is just yeah, like, just thought, yeah. the assessor has the line going through the house. <laughs> so, no, it really just doesn't match. And especially if it's Landcourt, the maps that are in Landcourt are different from the engineered maps that get filed on the recorded side. Um, and so that's, it's with registered land that you see a discrepancy between the lots in land court and the lots on the assessors. Yeah. And I don't know that we've really gotten to the bottom of that. Isn't that more up to the assessors to straighten out than it is us? Well, yes, but if we're trying to somehow fix the zoning map and the bylaws text, I would raise that with them at the same time. Well, again, I don't know how much of a problem we have with this either. I guess my question is who pays for this? Mm -hmm. Well, whose problem is it? Yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean it, it, it hasn't been a big problem. I mean, it seems like potentially, legally, it could at some point become a major issue, but so far it hasn't been a... It's not a, know, it hasn't been a problem for us. You know, well, don't we have something on there that says that the zoning bylaws govern? That this is for informational purposes, yeah. but the zoning bylaws mm -hmm. govern? I think yes. we have a just disclaimer on there. Yeah, uh, zoning boundaries are... <coughs> Please refer to the Town of Pembroke zoning ordinance. Yeah. For precise boundary locations and descriptions. Yeah. And I don't think that a surveyor would rely on those zoning maps, no, right? I think no. we can take that off the list. Um, I know the assessors are upset about this, though. But it's their problem. <laughs> we would work with them and be, we would cooperate with them if they considered a priority that they wanted to fund. Does that seem fair? Yeah. Um, so with use variances, we've talked about this at different points in time. To your question about zoning bylaw samples, 
in some zoning bylaws, they actually ban the ban the giving of a variance for a use restriction. So if an area is zoned residential or commercial, um, the, the ZBAs would not be authorized to give a use variance to say that you could put a commercial building in an area that's zoned residential. And part of the theory on that is it avoids what effectively becomes spot zoning, mm -hmm. at least the town less vulnerable, and it creates more cohesiveness that if we want to change uses in a particular area, that should be part of a process that involves town meeting and it involves an actual change to the zoning bylaws. I think it's important. But that may be hard to get through. I think it's going to be very important though for when we start coming up with new zoning for like the cluster or inclusion area or the accessory. That it can't just be waved that, away. That suddenly it's, you know, we, we put it in there as a cluster zone, and, but then suddenly someone comes back 10 years later and decides they'd like to be straight residential. They could just go, from, go from rental apartments to single family. Mm. With a use variance. With a use variance. Another issue may also be, you know, we've, we've grappled a little bit in the past with what's in a home business. Right? And the difficulty was in listing all the in home businesses allowed in the women's A. I think we came back, but basically we said professional. Right. There. The definitions are hazy. But so I think having professional in there is fairly, that's fairly clear. Fairly inclusive? Well, they had a couple of other uses in there that were very specific. That was the issue. Like TV and radio repair. <laughs> there were some. I mean, it, but sometimes what you can do there is say, rather than requiring a variance, is you could say these types of uses are require allowed. a special permit. Or are allowed. These are the things that are allowed. Right. right. And that's what we say in the. That's what we say now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, I think we've had a bigger issue in this when it comes to like multifamily or mixed use settings where the whole. Or <coughs> as I said, if we do something and go forward and do some inclusion and rezoning, that. Or if, if we add back in some multi use or multifamily in the center of protection district and other areas, can we, can we get everyone to agree on what that should look like and then stick with it? Yeah. You can't suddenly change the use down the road after we've Come up gone through site planning, gone through everything. Yep. Yeah. I think that's real important though. Um, What's the selling point though? The selling point meeting. is that, <laughs> that everyone should have to live by the same rules. And that if we come up with a set of rules that govern areas in town, and people want to change those rules, that we as a group change the rules and not just a one-off changing the rules for someone who might be someone's friend or might have a particular story as opposed to for everyone who falls into that same category. That it's a question of fairness. What we could also do, <clears throat> maybe Matt can help us with this, but we have years of ZBA decisions. No, but you would look, you go through them and you categorize them. Yeah. to see where all the variances are happening, and that may tell you where to go with the, z the zoning bylaws, where right. we need to make some changes because they're constantly asking for variances there, which right. means that it's now become really part of the zoning, if you think about it. Which yeah. is what I think he was suggesting on Business B lot size. They've already set the yeah, precedent. Yeah. They've already set the yeah. precedent, right, because they've, got, they've, they've given the variances, because that's what people are looking for, and that's what people are looking to do. But then we should go ahead and change the bylaws so everyone right. can do it because sometimes exactly. there are people who will push for it and there are other people who look at the bylaw and say, oh, I'm not entitled to it. Mm. And those people end up getting and if it's happening anyway, treated the least fairly because it's they're following fair. the rules. Yes, the people fair, who follow yeah. the rules best right. get treated the least fair, fairly. So we may want to look at that and that would at least give us a, you know, a direction. And then we can say, look, we see these use variances happening all the time. All the time. So we can adjust the bylaws to address those. Right. But then anything else that needs to happen and should you know, come if back. Got, if you've got 10 years of data behind you, you, you 
it, fairly easy to convince people what's been going on for 10 years, right? Okay, but how is Matthew going to have time to go through 10 I, years of... I, I'm not happy I'm not <laughs> that, that he do that, that, he do that in a short amount of time, but there may be a way that may, maybe we could find, you know, some help for him, that, you know, hourly help that would be able to go through and identify I, mean, I don't think you need stuff. to read the whole thing. You just need to read what section is what's getting... Right, right. exactly. You and you could, you could do it by the sections of the bylaw just, that are being... Yeah. yeah. Right? And then you put them in piles and you'd have some good data. I think, honestly, I, mean, I think most of the variances that they grant are single family lot situations. Not performing uses. And, you know, mm -hmm. and they're really data. looking at is right. this situated in such a way that it's going to cause a problem for the neighbors? Yeah, and a lot of them are, are, pre are existing non conforming situations like around the bonds and stuff. Or there are situations where we probably wouldn't want to change, like, you know, maybe a person. But I think, no, I think you're right. If you look at residence A, for instance, you may want to take those out of the equation and just take yeah. a look at what's going on in the other business zones right. where those variances are being, because that's really where, where we have our issues most Yeah, of the time. unless yeah. somebody's getting commercial approvals I mean, in residence A, which I don't think is happening. No. Yeah, I mean, in, in and we don't care about the, We don't care about the setback variance for a shed. Yeah, right, because I, that tends to be more unique to a circumstance. Or to a lot. Or yeah. lot. So I, I think we want to look at the other zones. And in fairness, I, don't, I, mean, I, don't, I think our ZBA, at least in the two years I've been here, I can't remember them granting any use variances. Um, Except they, for Center Street? Was that a use variance? Or, I mean, I think, I guess it kind of was a use variance, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Well, they had some restricted uses. Or at least they may change the percentage requirement anyway, they get the rest of the percentage. But I mean, they, they rarely do something. Like so, you know, the one, it's hard to say which ones come up often because it just doesn't happen that much. So I think it's a, so but, but one forward. would, I guess one would be the issue mm -hmm. of the, I think it's important the that we would deal with that 80,000 square foot minimum lot size and in business B, um, that one kind of has come up on several occasions, I guess. Uh, but probably if I look through the, the you know the old paperwork, I might find a few where I'd be like, oh yeah, that. Do we have a file here of all the CBA decisions? Yeah, so I keep a file at least since I've been here of their decisions. Okay. Um, I mean they're they're kind of lumped with the notices from other boards as well and stuff. Um, and there might be some Maryland might have kept the files. So maybe we need some more data so that we can justify whether that needs to happen. Um, and then the next one of mixed, mixed multifamily mixed use center assisted living um, and possibly increasing affordable housing to achieve our, our affordable housing goal of 10%. Or maybe just to, again, you know, there was an idea at one point that the mixed use would allow the development of a walking residential commercial district in the center of town. And we got rid of it, and we did say we would revisit it once we got through things. So I think that's that's part of the bigger question that we have to really, and whether we want a subcommittee or we want to find time to kind of present ideas to each other. How, how do people think that that's going to work best? With a formal subcommittee, informal discussions, they come back to the board of suggestions. How do, how do we want to really handle that? Well, are we going to drop the square foot requirement for business B? Because I think if we, would, we would probably want to do that. These two go together? Yeah. Okay, that's what you're saying. Because those are bigger issues. Like I, I, would hate to, I would hate to simply drop it to 40,000 and then simply add in mixed use again and then <coughs> have, have like a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't really intend. Right. Well, I can see, though, where on some of the business fee, you could have a rental unit and a business coexisting there. A small business, you know, like a, like a grooming shop or a, um, uh, a PT office where it's not owner-occupied. And we don't really allow that. Um, and I don't know if that's a bad thing. So is, is that allowed in the center now? It was for a while and then it it's wasn't. It's not now. It's not now. Well, we, it's, we, we anybody who's already together. doing it is already allowed, but it's currently not allowed. Why did we get away from that? 
Well, originally the theory was that maybe you have a, on the, the first floor is maybe a business, the second yeah. floor is maybe a, some, some apartments yeah. and That's stuff like that. Was. What happened was everything that got built was residential and no business yeah. got built. And so we got so rid it wasn't of it. Actually uh, mixed. So we got rid of it until we could relook at how we put in something that's enforceable. Yeah. And part of it was maybe we put it back in, but we put it back in with a provision that you can't have variances to allow a different mix. It's an awesome concept, like as a business owner, the, like my to situation. Offset your well, well, not so much that. It's if like someone's there, you know, with the right fit, and it's it's. it's but beautiful. that's why we need to get the use variance kicked out. <coughs> Because that's how the mix was getting changed. That was I think, strictly the speaking, they weren't getting use variances. They were just getting a variance of the percentage because they were still they were doing it as mixed use. You know, as for the the use of mixed use, they were just getting a variance to allow for like you know ninety percent residential instead of fifty percent. That's it's like use for completely different <laughs> use. So yeah, I guess we have true. to figure it's out a way to tie that so that what becomes the the design, and I do think on this one, we need to have a conversation with other boards and make sure that it's not just us sitting here saying this is what the plan should be. Right. Our developers, what, what's I mean, I think we try to get them to build what was going to sell. But what if what they say is what's going to sell easily? Right. Because there's what's going to sell and what's going to sell easily. And throwing up condos is going to sell easily. With that confidence and trying a new thing. But but the residential guys don't have the experience in developing commercial. And so they're not necessarily the people who understand how to create a mixed use development. Well, we also don't you have know? the properties available for, for a sizable mixed use um, project that would attract someone who's experienced at it. Right. They're generally looking at much bigger projects. Unless you were doing it close to Route 3, maybe. Or in the business B yeah, area. Or, at the, or along or, Washington. Or along where, where the community center is today. I mean, that's a big parcel of land. It's the last big piece. In the center. In the center. Yeah. And, um, and a good chunk of it's in Residence A. And the other part of it's in historic. And then there's uh, the. Um, Center Protection District. So <coughs> we also could just allow possibly more multifamily in certain zones if possible. That, that would probably... Well, it already happens. <coughs> well, except for the neighbors who then have to deal with the increase in traffic and the idea that if you have too much multifamily in town, it detracts from the... But that's what we seem to be getting. The value. Right? All I'd like to see us more move a little bit more to like cottages, duplex, and stuff like that versus it's single all family large. and that's all, It's all multi multifamily. I mean, all the condos on the 53 that have gone in, it's all multifamily. Yeah. And Which is kind of a shame because they don't have anything to go to on that street. Well, apparently they don't care. <laughs> I got a dairy yeah. <laughs> Except they can't park there. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting though because there's there are I, I'm trying to think of it and I'm trying to think out loud but I think I want to consider it more because if you just allow like what if we just say you could do more mixed uh, multifamily throughout town um, I see towns around us where they've gotten very densely packed in with multifamily and but they're, they're, they tend to be the affordable option for people in many cases. And it's a, it's a lifestyle change, too. I mean, the market's obviously robust in that category. Right? They build them, they sell them. Right. They, there's a market desire. But it can have a huge impact on your town services, too. Right. Sure. I mean, now you're, you know, if, does the in, increase in taxes on a three-bedroom condo cover the cost to town services for no, that three-bedroom no, condo. I don't know. No one's ever been able to, <coughs> it's unclear. to quantify that for me. The, the, the other you know, big if is, if you come out with a lot of, like, say, studio or, or two bedrooms, a lot of people will sell a four-bedroom and move into it, stay in town, 
but move from a four bedroom to a two yeah. bedroom or but, a studio if they retire or something like but that. But now you've you've opened up a four bedroom. So it's very, very difficult to actually analyze it because you don't know who moved where and what they left behind when they moved into something else. Do they upsize? Do they downsize? But look at look at two twenty seventh Street. Those you know you say people are going to downsize a two bedroom. They're large two bedrooms, but it's still a two bedroom, and the price points are not really the price points of these condos are not they're up there. They're up there. They're, up there. they're, up there. they're not really designed for. You know, we don't have a, a, we don't have a lot of inventory, a studio, a one bedroom, a small two bedroom, for people who really want to downsize to something that's in the two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I know what people tell you that they don't that the one bedrooms are not marketable. I, I, no, and that's what they tell you, whether it's true or not, or whether the path of least resistance is a three bedroom, two bath condo. That may be the path of least resistance in the one. Bedroom condos may be a little tougher. But there's nothing in the two fifty three hundred thousand dollar range that's going up around here. Mm -mm. No. no. It's just not happening. No. Very um, good. And the question is whether you could... That's all, and that's for the affordable range, is right? Well, I think for people who are going to downsize <coughs> and be on a restricted income, yeah, that's... So, for example, there's a... The, if you have the median income of... For a family of three is around 70000 in our area. And if you have that median income, an affordable unit, affordable unit for that family size, for that, for that income level, based on what what you'd have to pay for your mortgage, based on current interest rates. Yeah, I just got a twenty-three thousand dollars a year. That was, I just that's what was missing out of the I, uh, report. It, it never actually said. Well, because it changes it moves, so much. Yeah. So I just got a I just got a certified sales price. Recently, on an affordable unit, it was two hundred thirty-four thousand. That's how many bedrooms? It's a two-bedroom unit, but that's what a family of three can afford to pay if they are within the eighty oh, okay. percent of the median. Eighty percent of the median. Right. If you're within eighty percent of the median, which is generally what counts as affordable, but it varies. Like that changes from development to development, and depending on what gets negotiated, it it, it changes. But that's kind of a standard. Yeah. Um, so it's up to about fifty-two, fifty-three thousand a year in income. No, seventy thousand a year in income for a family of three. Is the median? I thought you said. You got to be eighty percent. Oh, eighty percent of the median is Correct. seventy. Okay. For a family of three. Family of three. And so <coughs> that leads through this calculation to a cert to a sales price of about two thirty four, and I'm sure those numbers vary from place to place, but that gives you kind of a sense of we're not building affordable housing in general. Just but, by making it multifamily well, doesn't it, it, necessarily it, mean it's going to be affordable. I'm saying if a developer was able to put four of those units on an acre, that might start to get more lucrative than your standard single family house, and it might get built. In other words, if I could take an acre and if I agree to make them affordable, I could, I could put fit four, four, four small dollars. ones on an acre instead of one big house on an acre. Right. Would I be more likely to build it? You'd have a tough sell. Well, the one big tough house sell for the zoning change or tough sell to a developer? I don't know about the. I don't, I don't know how the economics would work out, but I think it would be a very tough sell on the zoning change. Yeah, I, I would agree. With that. that would be a very. <coughs> <clears throat> to say if you have a lot that could support six bedrooms, you have a choice to do one six bedroom house or. Well, that may be a, 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 another way to kind of position it. Um, I mean, the carrot is that we you don't have to worry about a 40B one. You know? I know, but that. But where there's no control at all. I know, but it, it, it still may be a hard sell because people look at the 40Bs and go in and say, ah, that's not so bad. Well, well, this, I mean, would, this would be better, I would like to think. No, be I better. don't think it would, it would be worse. Oh, I see what you're saying. They look at they look at something like off of Birch Street, and they say, yeah. those are nice houses. Nice houses, that's it great. It looks like a nice subdivision. It's cluster zoning, basically. Uh, it's not zoned, right? It's a 40B, so it doesn't have to be zoning, but it's more like a cluster development in that the houses themselves tend to be smaller lots closer together and then a lot of open space. There's a lot of open space in part because there's other types of land there. Um, I think what they would worry about is the uh, 
240 b you're going to have enough acres to build enough units for it to be to spread out and spread out where you'd be worried about your next door neighbor selling out to a developer tearing down a house and putting four units in it may be a tough that may be a tough yeah. set yeah it could get a lot of it could get a lot of that for, yeah. i mean not that it should be allowed. looked at there may be another there may be another solution but that may be a very tough set so hard well, every unless, unless there's a part of town where we're getting multifamily requests like group 53 or something where this might be something rather than expanding the amount of big condo developments that you could have smaller little well, see, it's, it's, it's something by special houses. permit that we, it's still a public hearing. Mm -hmm. People get to come in and voice their opinion versus a 40 B where they don't even get to have an opinion. Well, but with if we get to the 10% too, and with the housing production plan, we're, we're better positioned to actually negotiate with the developers on 40 B. Well, but in 2020, we're probably not going to be at 10% well, unless we do we something also, between now and then. But we also found, and the CBA has adopted um, some more rules for 40Bs, that you know, we weren't, we didn't have anything before. Right, so and we have a little bit more control. We have a little there. bit more control, and there's ways to also get some you know, money back from the developer with some fees mm -hmm. that we, we can incur if and we And then we can build some units. And well, take care of some issues. Well, that's where you may have that affordable housing trust, and you may be able to do something with, with that we, type of fee. So we do have a lot of town on land that we could use. We do have a lot of town on land. That's guaranteed. <coughs> I didn't think there was a lot of town on land except that school lot on 53. No, West Elm Street. Where in West Elm do we have a ton of town on land? That was Actually, development. The development that um, land that can be developed easily is uh, North Pembroke. Where? North Pembroke Elementary School. Looks like we've about the school property and then about 50, 60 acres around it. <coughs> really? Yep. That's not already used for fields and things? And then there's other, you know, you think about um, the country club. You know, it will be a golf course forever. Isn't there way behind the high school? Yeah. Um, it would be hard to get to. We don't want to buy it. Yeah, it still may be hard to get to. The elevation's changed dramatically. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, you <laughs> know, there's a lot of wet, little wet sports yeah. and stuff <laughs> back there, too. Yeah, presumably the elementary school kids, they don't need, like, a lot of fields to run. Like, that's more the high school kids. Oh, yeah. Can you point it to me? School. Jim, can you point? Right here. Oh, okay. Yep. Up the You probably couldn't do too much because the access would be off the residential streets. So. Well, there's already an access to the school. Off of the residential streets. Yeah. Or if you Which is wide, no, as wide as the subdivision road already. Yeah. Well, the, the, so what you're talking about is not building a huge development of oh. condos so oh. much as something like what you're saying, which is. Maybe It'd be houses. owned by the town, probably owned by the housing authority. Everyone's always afraid of having more housing authority units that are not over 55. Like people don't seem to have a problem with the over 55 affordable units. Actually, it looks like there's an easement where it goes back out on the water stairs, so you could potentially have an access to go all the way through. By the shooting range. <laughs> no, the shooting range is not below, right? That's not below. Oh, you're talking about the, the used to be an old shooting range there. Yeah. Well, that the Pembroke Police use it. They still use it? Yep. <coughs> All right. Okay, so that's a bigger question. Um, and the accessory dwelling units is, is sort of a bigger question, too. So on the, on the administrative questions, um, I think we could ask Matthew to talk to KP Law about proposing some drafting on the site plan appeal confusion, on the addresses on the sign, on just the basic point of having the 12-month period <coughs> brought into conformance with Mass General Law. Um, can I add one to before I forget it again? Yeah. Uh, for the. Uh, 
site plan, the requirement for that. Yeah. We still have a situation where if someone's taking up residence in the cemetery, they need site plan approval. Why do we have Because you're putting a man-made structure of vault below ground. <laughs> <laughs> that, that clause is just way too broad. It says if you're doing anything at all, you need site plan approval. But, I mean, in practice, has that really been a problem? It kind of has, because, well, we, not so we, much as, well. well early, <laughs> early on, it was more of a problem. Well, it's more of a problem. That issue. Yeah, it was, yeah. What triggers, what <coughs> exactly what triggers, triggers site plan? <coughs> Is this, are they going to do site plan for this new? Because we've, we've, new we've done, we've, yeah, I mean, we've triggered site plan for an awning being put up. Right, we need to kind of like relax a little or just right. decide what we really want there. Although right. I feel like sometimes building permits go for sites, so for changes <coughs> that I would have expected site plan to have Yeah, I've, I've seen I have, a couple in town. I have a couple in mind. That I was a little shocked that they didn't go for site plan. Right, and it really, there were sites that weren't great that maybe we could have gotten some improvements out of mm. if we had triggered a site plan review. Um, um, so that's always a tough one for me because we certainly have the ability to say we don't consider it to be a, um, we consider it a minor modification of an existing site plan and we'll approve it without a full set of hearings, right? Yeah, sometimes we talk to people you don't need a site plan. Yeah, you just you need to vote to, <coughs> I guess, consider to waive um, the requirement for site plan. But like for the guy who probably, I don't know, when Jim did sports or something, built a tiny little porch, or when the guy built a new, you know, like a, just a, a tiny little canopy in front of this building, some really trivial things like that. Which I think makes sense. I mean, those are definitely things where there's no need to go for full set. But it's always good to at least reserve kind of the board's discretion, I suppose, that you can. You know, Okay, so how are we going to bring this forward? Well, the ones that require more discussion, are we going to have a, we've talked about a subcommittee. Is that really what we want, or do we want more meetings like this? This was good. Um, I think this is great, but, you know, we took a lot of time. Yeah? Uh, we don't usually have this much time. I know. As a matter of fact, um, it's about time for me to make my motion. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 some some guidance from you guys. What do you, what do you think we should do? Let's try to take care of the administrative ones first. Yeah. Uh, oh, we yeah we have plenty of time to take care of the other ones. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're not. Our hair is on fire. Stinks is we go a long time in between. You forget how we left it. So I feel like we made a ton of progress tonight. And then, Four meetings from now, we'll bring this up. Now. Okay, what did we say? Well, um, to <laughs> that, that he's taking the well, it's on, well, to that pretty good job of uh, reminding what you said. Yeah. yeah, that might be helpful if you want to update. Yeah, yeah, that would be Matthew update yeah. this. Oh, Matthew, what, 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 what's some action what items? Andy's yeah. uh, suggesting is that you update the list you had sent to us with sort of action items from tonight. You take the yeah. list we were working from tonight and put in what the board said tonight into this list. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Would be, yeah. yeah. and then that would, because you're right, we, we tend to forget what we said. Yeah. Just like the it would be nice if you were Matthew got notes. <laughs> 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 yeah. Can you read? No, he's taken better notes than I have, I think. Well, my hand is pretty terrible, so. Uh, I don't think he's great, but. Oh, Matthew, yeah. 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 Oh, before I forget, Matthew did look up the Board of Health and what the requirement is for wells. They do require all wells in town to be potable water and be tested. That's right. So you can't do like all the irrigation. You can't do a straight irrigation well. Well, you can have an irrigation well, but it still it's needs to be, be potable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Which I think that'll be. I don't think we could force that on the developer. How can you force someone to have potable water? I think well on the property. Huge asset to make it a piece of property. Right. So the question is whether the Board of Health would ever reconsider that with respect to commercial it really properties. Cost that much more, yeah. Unless well, it's it a can. bad. No, I'm saying I'm saying we can't we can't force someone to put in a well. 
because they may not be able to. You could render a property unbuildable. Yeah. What is the point of that? Why somebody goes and drinks out of God knows? I think it's more to make sure that everyone comes to the town Well, no, that's why I'm wondering whether they would consider any um, variations to that rule in the commercial area where it's clearly going to be used by maintenance personnel. Just like you drive the corporate park and then where they irrigate, it just looks so classy and clean. It's possible just to love them to. I guess we have to just check with World Health and see if they'll... I think, I think they probably would in certain exceptions. Tom, I'm waiting for your motion. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, he doesn't want to go on record as making the motion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I make a motion. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thank you. 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 Thank you.